my near-death experience was the most humbling event of my entire life. When you leave physical reality by death, you know, permanently, you go into another dimension. Um, you, there is a continuation of existence. I know it firsthand. I've been there, seen it. Can't talk me out of it. Well, my name is Laura Kethledge. I'm an author and a filmmaker, and I'm living in the United States. Um, I'm a woman of a certain age. Uh, my dad was an engineer. My mom was a nurse. Uh, at the time, I was going to a junior college and doing terrible when I had the accident. Um, I had an event, an accident that changed my core self, my core value shifted. And I want to preface this. This was 1979 when a uh, near-death experience and psychic phenomena was never discussed. So what happened was I decided to go horseback riding. 1979, Centerville, Virginia, got a horse, rented a horse that was way too much above my abilities. And when you're 19, you think you're indestructible. Well, the long story uh, the, the, or the, the stupidity of it was I decided to race my horse back to the barn with some other people I met up on a trail at the end of that afternoon. I never got to the barn. The horse was going way too fast and really took off and hit a golfer, you know, like one of those gopher holes. And uh, I never felt the impact because I did not hit the ground, my body did. What happened was at one second I was on the horse and I knew I was gonna fall, I knew something bad was gonna take place. I mean, I've been around horses my whole life. I was falling to the right side and I left my body. This was, I would equate this, just imagine you're sleeping in bed and you live in Milwaukee and it's the middle of the night and you're in your bed and then you're thrown into the Pacific Ocean. It was that abrupt. Oh. So, well, I can't tell you I was one of these brave people that embraced near death or anything like that. Oh. I was a teenager. I would just begun to live. I had a boyfriend, my first apartment, a job, a car. I was going to school. I was engaged in life. So when I left my body, it was like a click. It happened so instantaneous, right? I was right there and then I wasn't. And my soul, my second self or whatever, I still felt like me. And I was going through this dark tunnel. It was black velvet and it was dense and soft at the same time. I know that makes no sense. And at the end of this tunnel, you know, I knew I was dead. I knew it was over. And I had a roller coaster of emotions, shock, grief, regret, every human emotion that I ever had because I did not want to live. I didn't want to lose. I didn't want to die. And I was so ill prepared for this and so terrified. It was gut wrenching, you know, it was horrible. I wasn't one of these brave people. And a lot happened. And I'm just going to kind of sum it up because so many details are inexpressible. My grandfather, who I loved, who died when I was 12 years old, yes. died a horrible death of cancer. Mm -hmm. He was my guide. Mm -hmm. And I got to be re reunited with a person I loved and trusted. So that was everything. So that was the good part. And that was such a relief <clears throat> to see him. It was such a relief that there was somebody there. Um, he had, in life, he had the bluest eyes, like, you know, Paul Newman, electric eyes. Well, he mm. still had the electric eyes, although he wasn't sick. Mm. He wasn't in pain. And he still loved me. And it was like no time had transpired between us. Yes. I hadn't seen him since I was 12. Yes. I'm 19 now. That's a long time. Mm. And I felt total acceptance and love by him. And I still do. Yeah. And he's still watching out for me. So that was the flip side. That was the goodie I got from this. But what happened was, you know, you get shown your life. And it's not like a judgment day. But you get shown, you go to a place and you get shown all of your actions. Let's say if you were cruel to somebody at school. 
Mm -hmm. or, or, or you were just inconsiderate when you didn't mean to it. You feel those emotions from the other person. Yes. And it happens sequential. It happens very quick. It's like a flicking through a roller deck. Although you ingest all of those feelings. And I have to say, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't find it pleasant. There was a few good things that I did. You know, I'm glad like, you know, like, you know, stuck with animals, okay. saving my dog from getting hit by a car, you know, stuff like that. But it was pretty, pretty awful. And uh, now at 65, with some insight in life, I could have handled it. Mm -hmm. But at 19, I really couldn't have. And it, it wasn't going well. And uh, time there isn't what time is here. And I got a series, I think, of shown a series of things just so that I would be to I, I have more understanding. Like um, I went to this hall, somebody was guiding me from the back. I, I lost my grandfather on the way. I went to this hall and I was shown like, it's like a cathedral. Like there's all these souls on one side and then all these souls on the other lined up. Mm. There was a lot, like at least 75 on each. Mm. One side I was told was male, one side was female, and these were my supposed past lives. Mm. Well, I was raised Christian, Judeo-Christian ethics, okay, Presbyterian to be exact. Nobody prepares you for this. I, I never read any of that yeah. in Bible school. I didn't yeah. like it. Um, it was pretty intense and vivid, and that was one thing I really wasn't too keen on. I didn't feel a connection with any of these but it was just an explanation. Mm -hmm. Now, when you travel and you're going through, let's say the earth is here and it's very dense and this is physical reality where my fist is. There's these layers or dimensions that there's a progression and a logic to it that I can't explain. And then there is soul. So when I was guided or traveled to source, things got fun because it felt like a wonderful rush and I lost the feeling of having like arms and legs and stuff. Perhaps I was a point of consciousness. I'm really not sure. I'm guessing. But when I burst into soul or source bliss, I can tell you one thing. I wanted for nothing. I wanted for nothing. I was floating in a sea of love. Mm -hmm. I know there's other souls around me, but I felt comforted like I had come home and it looked I I don't know I guess you could say like clouds and there was bright sun but there was no sun and this beautiful music just kind of floated in random waves and yeah. I could have stayed there for a long time um it was beautiful and what I think about it I'll tell you a little bit later I'm just telling you the near-death experience so I've got to see my grandfather have life review, um, going to be shown that I had lived before. Didn't like that idea. Still don't. Mm -hmm. Made yeah. it to source. And then I was like taken away from source. And then I went backwards and I would say into a dimension or layer that was more thought responsive. Yes. And it was a place. And I know that other souls were there. And it was this beautiful little beach. And then by the beach was these uh, cliffs and there was windows in the cliffs. So I thought, well, there must be residents because there's windows. Wow. Mm. Is this weird in mm. the afterlife? And I thought about my religious upbringing. And then I thought about the tree of life. It was just flickering through my mind. And suddenly there was this beautiful luminous pine tree mm. in the beach in the shore. And of course, you know, it's totally illogical. And I got, close to it and the bark was so iridescent and it was like this light mossy white it was very cool mm. and as soon as I was getting all interested in this I was like pulled back then there was a lot of things that happened and then I was coming back towards physical reality my grandfather was there and I was in this layer closer to physical reality it was all mauve colored and different vibrate, vibrational uh, link. I wasn't in pain or anything. I felt like I had my body. And all of, there was so many epiphanies. There's so many lessons. There's so many things 
that I had learned on this journey and it started being taken away. Like this wonderful gift that was given to you and then it was getting pulled right out of your hands, right out of your fingertips. And I was very distressed. And I said to my grandfather, this experience has been so long and now it's over and I had to come back and I wasn't happy about it. I didn't take it well. Let me put it that way. I wasn't gracious about it or like, oh, thank you for, you know, nothing like that. I was kind of a, a nasty little teenager. So it came back into my body with a perceivable thud and, and into a lot of pain because I'd gotten hurt. I'd broken my nose. I'd broken my finger. I was, there was an, a part of me that wasn't injured. And I guess I'd had compressions on my chest. I don't know. My chest hurt. It was pretty bruised. The first thing I think of, Will, is this. I open my eyes and I'm looking to all these concerned people around me and there was a car in the field and there was a group of people. So I had been gone a long time, you know, you know, you know, five, 10 minutes or whatever. And I'm back. And the first thing I look in this field, and it's a beautiful day. And I think this is not reality. So then I, they, I was on my way to the hospital. I passed out, didn't leave my body or anything like that. I got to the hospital and uh, I really was hurt. And um, the doctor and the nurses, they did, and everybody hovered until I said to the doctor, and I was trying to tell him about this near death experience or whatever you would call it about. I saw my grandfather had a conversation with him. But, you know, I was trying to tell him in, in a very, very precise words. And he said to me, he said, what drugs have you taken? Like my mom was there because she was a nurse at the hospital and they had called her. My mom was there. My mom was pretty teed off because she knew, first of all, I don't do drugs, never have, never will, not a person that could enjoy them. So, you know, I was getting dismissed by the doctor and shamed right in front of the whole staff. You know, what drugs did you take? And all these awful things that he said and all this disconcern. And my mother said, you know, we've got to admit her. She's had a head injury. Uh, maybe she dreamt or had a hallucination, you know, my, my kids really injured and the doctor didn't want to know me. So my mother got very frustrated and she said, I'll just take you home. And we got to the Merrifield uh, traffic light and I had the surgery. I got to get back. I got to get back. I was panicked. I've got to get back. I started getting out of the, uh, out in the busy car intersection. It was pretty scary for my mom. I calmed down after a few hours you know, came back to, uh, you know, logic or whatever. I mean, I, I was trying to grapple with it all for about 12 hours. I just realized I've got to be tight lipped. So I went to a therapist and I tried to talk to her about it. And she said, are you having a pity party because you broke your nose and you're such a pretty girl? So when I say I shut down, I didn't talk about it. I didn't know what to do about it. And it really became... Uh, a, a millstone around my neck for a long time. I wasn't getting a glimpse, but I mean, the idea that I was ever male kind of freaked me out. And I went over to touch one of them and it was kind of this like middle-aged white guy. Um, <laughs> I didn't have a connection to him. So then I went over the other side and I touched one of the the women and she, um, I don't know. She reminded me of a very cranky lunch lady we had in grammar school. I mean, I wasn't some great beauty or I wasn't, you know, anything special. And I did not feel a connection really with them. Like they were parts of me. But I want to say something. When I was at source, what is source? Okay. Is it God? No, I think it was like God is very, very far away from that. This is as far as you can go and then come back and still be alive. I think it, it, each person has a source or, um, you know, um, let me put it in another way. Maybe the listeners will understand, Will. I learned that when the soul comes into physical reality, we come into physical reality and are born in order to learn lessons because earth is this exquisite teaching machine, you know. So we fracture into different personalities at different time periods. Um, the idea of this is kind of creepy, but I think you fracture into all of these different personalities. And I think you dive, everybody dies eventually. Uh -huh. And um, you kind of migrate back to source, your source. And those parts of yourselves are come together. 
I still think you're an individual and it's probably pretty incomprehensible to the human mind how this works. No, at least maybe smarter people get it better than I did. But when I was in that sea of love and there were souls around me, I think there were aspects of myself. It wasn't the tree of life. I was uh, just thinking about the tree of life and then it appeared. What it showed to me is that these, um, the further you're away from physical reality, the closer you're out of source, they're more thought responsive, more thought responsive reality. So let's say you're thinking about a boat, maybe a boat will manifest or an image of a boat to you. Um, I don't think it was a true tree of life, but it was pretty cool. I was uh, in, um, brought up a Presbyterian. I sang in the church choir. We were very active in the church. My grandfather was a minister. Uh, we weren't Bible thumpers or anything like that, you know, <laughs> you know. I mean, not at all, but okay. um, I went to Bible camp and, you know, I joined the church when I was, but I always have to say, you know, I'd go to Bible school and they would tell you these things. And I never really accepted the literal version of the Bible. I always figured as a teenager, people wrote it. Now, yeah. I know that this might piss people off, but, you know, organized religion is in the control business. Pretty much. Uh -huh. They can, they really, really are. Even though they do some really good things. I mean, but they are, are the people that gave you the Inquisition and a lot of wars and the Crusades and all that crap. So yeah. people are running organized religions. What I took out of uh, it when I was brought up as a Christian is the message of the Bible is kindness, being a good person, helping somebody else, at least not wrecking somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much what I picked up the be nice, you know, uh, be kind and generous when you can and do no harm, basically do no harm. Mm -hmm. But did I pick up the literal version of the Bible? Apparently not, because I was, I guess I was less indoctrinated. Uh, and it just, I didn't have a come to Jesus near death experience. I just didn't. It seemed a little bit more logical to me. Uh -huh. And I think that your <laughs> thoughts and beliefs mold and construct different, perhaps, illusions when you go to these more thought responsive places out of physical reality. Yes. Like a little kid, let's say if a little kid, God forbid, dies, has a near death experience, what is that little kid going to need? He's going to need a religious figure giving him comfort. Mm -hmm. Like if, if he doesn't know anybody that's dead and he doesn't have a grandfather to greet him, maybe a soul or uh, will appear as a religious figure to give the kid comfort and to help him and guide him. So I think a lot of things, you kind of see what you need to see. My near-death experience was the most humbling event of my entire life. It changed my core values because you don't believe in heaven or, you know, you, there are beliefs that you have that you're taught as a kid, like there is a heaven and blah, blah, blah. It's not a belief. It's a known. Mm -hmm. When you leave physical reality by death, you know, permanently, you go into another dimension. Um, you, there is a continuation of existence. I know it firsthand. I've been there. I've seen it. Can't talk me out of it. Uh, it wasn't a hallucination. Um, it is wonderful to know that, not just hope for it, but to know that there that is that's what's going to happen. Yeah. So that's good. But the core values, like this NDE kind of ate at me. Like, you know, I was 20, 21, 22. I had some things happen. Saw my aunt after she died. You know, I had a real hard time grappling with it all. Um, there are after effects that come with you after a near-death experience. You'll have like a flashback and remember little fragments. And, you know, it's a little tough. Now, I went to a therapist when I was 25 and I just blurted it all out. I figured, mm -hmm. what have I got to lose? Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> She really knew me. She really listened to me. And she said, well, I've heard this before. I believe you've had a near-death experience. I didn't know there was a name for it because I hadn't really read anything. So she suggested that I read Robert Monroe's books. 
She says, listen, this is going to be a time saver for you. Read his books. It's pretty logical. It'll explain how it works. So I read his books and I was like, oh, somebody with good common sense. It's not putting a religious spin and trying to make a, you know, a buck off this. And yes. he kind of, explained, you know, that really helped me. And as, as soon as I got that under my belt, you know, I felt a real healing. I also feel, you know, that there is, you're more aware there are after effects after a near-death experience that other people have had too, not just myself. Yeah. I'm glad I had it. I wish I could ex have skipped the injuries and I wish I could have asked better questions, mm. formulated better questions and remembered more about my near-death experience. Small things here that we perceive as small are very, very big and meaningful on the other side. Yes. When you do something genuinely kind for a stranger or a friend or help somebody along or send them compassion, that is really, really huge. Um, letting go of, um, I don't know. I'm like a really flawed person that happened to have an NDE. I've got a potty mouth, sometimes a bad temper. I'm not a saint. And this did not make me a nicer person, but it made me more, more aware. Mm -hmm. So in this life, my biggest accomplishment is I became aware, but I also learned, um, there are some big no-no's that uh, you should be aware of. When you interfere, when a person interferes in somebody else's destiny, let's say it's a husband and he marries a nice woman and he berates her and he changes the person that she could have been. That's a huge, huge thing. You think somebody being verbally abusive isn't that bad. It really is. It really is. Um, there is no heaven and hell there, there is no demons. There's no the boogeyman is not laying on the other side. I think there's some less desirable places that you could go because I think there's some kind of really bad people that die that don't change a lot. You're still you when you die. So yeah. you might as well work out your issues while you're alive. It's a big time saver. It's, it's uh, hard to express uh, a near-death experience, but it's nothing to fear. Um... After having mine, I don't fear death. I just want to make the most I can of my time, be the best person I can. Um, and I know that there's really comfort into knowing that you're going to be re reunited with the people that you love. Um, that love never dies. And that's a very wonderful thing. And I have let it, letting go of the fear of death has just been very, very liberating for myself.